So, um, in the interest of keeping time, I think we're going to start and hope that our coffee drinking friends will join us. Uh, my name is Murray Hebert from the Southeast Asia program here at CSIS. Uh, delighted uh, you're here to talk, join us to the, on the discussion of infrastructure connectivity, where are Asia's big gaps. Uh, we have a, a, a great panel here. We're gonna, going to uh, uh, educate us on, on their views about the uh, infrastructure gaps. Our first speaker is to Toshiyuki Sakamoto, who is the Deputy Director General for Trade Policy at the Ministry of Economy, Industry, and Trade in Japan. This, in this job, he's responsible for, for J Japan's economic cooperation in, in the region. He's also the APEC senior official uh, representing Japan, and uh, uh, he's also Japan's representative in dialogue with the, uh, with the ASEAN countries. He's been in MITI for, for th almost 30 years and uh, been, had various responsibilities in energy and manufacturing. Uh, next to, to him is uh, Greg Stephenson, who is the representative of the Asia Development Bank, ADB, here in Washington. He's representative for North America. Prior to coming to Washington, Craig was in, um, in Bangkok, where he was the Thai resident um, uh, head of the Thai office for ADB. He's also been in Afghanistan and, and various other places in the region. Next to uh, Craig is uh, Vikram Nehru, who is a uh, senior associate in the Asia program and the Bakri chair in Southeast Asia studies at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Before taking this job, Vikram uh, for 30 years was uh, served at the, uh, at the World Bank, had various positions, including uh, the lead economist on Indonesia and China. And next to uh, Vikram is Suzanne Kelly Lyle, who is uh, independent policy advisor for ASEAN Affairs. She's uh, had various roles uh, advising public, private, and civil society organizations on capacity building, stakeholder engagement, and governance issues. Her most recent posting was uh, to serve as a governance director for the Mekong Partnership for the Environment. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Toshiyuku, to Toshiyuki Sakamoto, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mari. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. Um, Eight trillion US dollars. Uh, this number is most frequently mentioned to show the big demand for infrastructure in Asia Pacific region up to 2020. This huge demand cannot be met by government budget of developing countries and ODA from the ODA from uh, the advanced countries alone. In fact, the percentage of infrastructure investment in government budget in ASEAN countries tend to decrease due to their policies aimed at fiscal uh, deficit reductions. Uh, this is the case for ODA from advanced countries as well, uh, due, uh, due, due to the, uh, the same reason. So mobilization of private sector's money and the introduction of private sector's know-how is essential. PPP needs to be utilized. But compared with Latin America and South Asia, PPP development in East Asia is lagging behind. In 2013, the number of PPP projects in East Asia is just 85. 16 billion US dollars. This is just a quarter or one fifth of Latin America. And more than 70% of the project are electricities. So the establishment of institutional mechanism for PPP and institutional capacity building, the capacity building of people working there is essential, is needed. And there are many cases where appropriate risk sharing and cost sharing between public and private sectors are not ensured. Against this backdrop, Japan put forward comprehensive support measures for PPP promotion by utilizing Japanese yen loan. This pa package was announced last year. The measures include EBF, uh, equity-backed finance 
Uh, this is a Yen loan to, for recipient government equity contribution in SPC of PPP project. VGF viability gap fund, this is to ensure the profitability of SPC. Contingent credit enhancement facility, sorry for this jargon. Uh, this is to address the risk of uh, not non-compliance of sales contract of off takers such as electricity and water SOEs. Japan is also carrying out a lot of capacity buildings, uh, including the support for the development of comprehensive infrastructure development plan in Asian countries, um, support for the establishment of PPP uh, institutional mechanism, as well as support for formation of even individual projects. The gap exists in terms of the quantity of finance, but also gap, gap also exists in the quality of infrastructures. There are many, many cases where, although the initial cost of the project is cheap, the construction delayed or a designed performance was not realized, et cetera, et cetera. So Japan put forward in APEC uh, the proposal on the quality of infrastructure including life cycle cost, because the developing economies tend to focus on initial cost. Environmental performance and the safety, including resilience to natural disasters. APEC developed with Japanese initiative the guidebook on these elements of quality of infrastructure. APEC last year also agreed upon the blueprint on physical connectivities, which includes three cross-sectoral issues, PPP, quality of infrastructure, and other principles like human-centered investment, including uh, local people employment, uh, environmental and the social considerations, financial soundness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people are now talking about a lot about AIIB, but I believe that AIIB, AIIB needs to discuss in such a wider context. My Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe's commitment on quality of infrastructure is deep and firm. He discussed this with President Jokowi, Indonesia, when he visited Japan in, in the end of March. And Jokowi uh, welcomed uh, Prime Minister Abe's commitment on, quote, a quality infrastructure for quality growth, unquote, through human-centered investment. The details of this initiative has yet to be seen, but you will see that in due course this year in a lot of international fora, not only APEC, but also G20, Japan ASEAN, and Japan MECON, etc. Um, last but not least, uh, let me touch upon uh, CADP, Comprehensive Asia uh, Development Plan, which was developed by area. E-R-I-A, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. I mention this because uh, this is the uh, example where Japan and the United States can collaborate in order to identify what kind of infrastructures are important in East Asia from demand side point of views. Uh, with the mandate from East Asia Summit, October 2009, Area developed a CADP in collaboration with ADB and ASEAN Secretariat. A comprehensive Asia Development Plan, CADP, was endorsed by East Asia Summit in October 2010. They identified about 700 project, infra infrastructure projects and prioritized them. The amount of the investment necessary is 400 billion US dollars. Um, they, also, I, they also found that about 20% of this project can be financed through PPP. They also carried out a regional economic impact analysis uh, in case uh, major economic corridors were established. This became the basis for ASEAN's MPAC, Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivities. Now this plan is being revised with the instruction from, again, East Asia Summit. United States can join this discussion 
can join this initiative because this will be discussed in EAS Economic Minister's meeting this summer. This is a unique East Asia-wide project that can't be implemented by APEC, covering China, India, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar. We will, CADP2 will, will look into what, how the connectivity could be strengthened for, in order for ASEAN to further participate in global production network. Infrastructure quality, as well as disciplines of donors, will be also addressed. As was the case original CADP, uh, area will collaborate with international organization, most notably ADB. Area expects the input from uh, US government as well as US business communities. And I hope that this will lead to meaningful uh, in infrastructure development of Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Toshiyuki san. Uh, Craig Stephenson? Craig. Thank you, Murray, and uh, good morning, everyone. Asia has become uh, the world's growth engine, but the infrastructure deficit across the Asia Pacific is substantial. In 2011, uh, the Asian Development Bank estimated that by 2050, an additional 3 billion Asians could enjoy standards of living similar to those found in Europe and North America today. And the region could account for over half of global output. But this promising outcome could only be realized if Asia sustains its present growth momentum. In a 2009 report entitled Infrastructure for a Seamless Asia, we estimated that Asia will need $8 trillion in national infrastructure and $290 billion in regional infrastructure through 2020, or average infrastructure during this period of about $750 billion per year to sustain the region's current growth trajectory and establish the foundations for the next phase of growth. Um, <clears throat> this report I just mentioned, um, Infrastructure for a Seamless Asia, is where this $8.3 trillion figure that gets mentioned so many times came from. And it's worth taking a look at. It's the, the numbers are broken down by, by subregion, by country, by sector, by subsector. There are lots of projects listed. Um, I guess most of the money is sort of earmarked for mobile phones, ports, and sanitation. But the Asian highway, uh, Asian railway, and Asian container port schemes also figure prominently into things. Um, Asians, Asia's development dilemma is one of high levels of robust growth across the region not yet translating into adequate and quality infrastructure. ASEAN countries, for example, and there are a lot of success stories in this grouping, but, but ASEAN countries need $1.1 trillion in infrastructure investments. Um, this inability to undertake necessary infrastructure investment in line with the pace of their economic growth has exacted a heavy toll. Uh, all you have to do is look at traffic and uh, traffic congestion, pollution, and, and uh, it's not a stretch to say worsening distribution of income uh, to see what I'm talking about. Uh, in each of the key sectors, roads, railways, phones, electricity, and clean water, the subregion has a long way to go before it catches up with OECD countries. Countries should be investing 5 to 9 percent of annual GDP on roads, railways, ports, urban development, power, telecom, irrigation, water supply, and sanitation, and the like. But with the possible exception of Vietnam, no ASEAN country has come close to what they need to spend. India's eco uh, Indonesia's economy has, has, has done well the past few years, but it's only spending 2 to 3 percent of GDP on infrastructure, and we should we should probably be spending at least twice as much. The same applies for the Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia. Existing international financial institutions like ADB and the World Bank won't come close to closing the financing gap. And the countries on their own through their, their, their um, government budgets uh, aren't going to make much of a dent either. Uh, ADB's combined operations last year, including co-financing, totaled over $21 billion. 
or less than 2% of Asia's infrastructure needs for last year. ODA from all sources to the entire world, um, I mean, from the entire world to the developing world last year totaled about $130 billion, or 17% of Asia's needs. It follows that ADB welcomes the emergence of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank um, based on an understanding that it will adhere to international best practices on environmental and social safeguards, as well as uh, fair and open procure uh, procurement procedures. And we look forward to considering appropriate forms of cooperation once AIB is formally established. But I'd go, you know, given what I've just said, I, I'd, I'd like to posit that, that Asia's binding development constraint is not the lack of funds. It's really its inability to develop and channel existing pools of savings into bankable projects. Many Asian countries possess significant domestic savings. ASEAN alone has more than $700 billion that could finance infrastructure. And with yields on government bonds at record lows, International banks, pension funds, and private investors are scouring emerging and frontier markets, eager to fund long-term projects that offer a better rate of return. Unfortunately, memories of the 97 Asian financial crisis and more recently the world financial crisis remain fresh in the minds of policymakers and investors who are very uh, wary of risk and don't want to be burned again. Investors in particular are unwilling to commit major resources for large projects over the long term without lots of guarantees, which governments uh, have been reluctant to provide. To remedy this situation, ADB believes first governments need to step up the game to fast track infrastructure delivery and clear bottlenecks to create a pipeline of transparent, well-structured projects that allow for private investors and market mechanisms. You know, we've, we've spent a lot of time in government offices in ADB the last few years to see what big projects are ready to go, requiring financing. And there's not a whole lot there, if you know what I mean. So they really need to uh, do some homework and get these projects uh, ready for consideration. Second, it's necessary to address a range of policy, institutional, and regulatory impediments to create a robust and predictable regulatory environment that assures investors that their schemes will not be canceled or stalled halfway through construction and will not be renegotiated when a new administration assumes office. Third, to attract debt capital, which is essential for large-scale infrastructure financing, projects must be structured more effectively. Uh, public sector support is required to address the high degree of perceived risk on long tenor infrastructure financing. Specifically, governments need to resolve governance problems and to establish transparent pro uh, procurement procedures and to put in place clearly designed viability gap funding mechanisms to entice investors to step up their investments. The real issue when it comes to closing gaps to infrastructure connectivity is not how much money is there on the table. Rather, it's the need for countries to first improve their governance re uh, regimes. The rule of law, independent regulators and ju judiciaries, predictability, clean politics and political, instabil uh, political stability are all essential elements in the highly competitive race for private capital. Um, I should add that the politiza uh, put politicization of infrastructure priorities and frequent changes in uh, public policy don't help things much. Singapore and Hong Kong are cases in point. Were the elements that I just mentioned in place, funds might be expected to rush in of their own accord. Absent these elements, all the liquidity in the world is probably of little use. Multilateral institutions have an important role to play. Uh, ADB, the World Bank, uh, the AIIB, and the New Development Bank uh, don't have sufficient resources to fill their gaps. Uh, but we can leverage our creditworthiness to mobilize Asian capital for Asian growth. Uh, for example, issuance of local currency infrastructure bonds guaranteed by multilateral agencies for infrastructure projects. Uh, I could talk more about that, but I need to wrap up. Um, in 2011, the ASEAN economies, together with ADB, established something called the ASEAN Infrastructure <laughs> Fund. It has just under $500 million in equity capital. It was a first step to mobilize the region's resources for infrastructure development. Uh, 
More recently, we've established a dedicated office and recruited a really good team to promote public-private partnerships. Many more uh, such steps are required if the region is to sustain its growth momentum. In the final analysis, uh, Asia's infrastructure or inadequate infrastructure could hobble its attempts to achieve strong, sustainable growth and prosperity. But if they do things right, and we have every reason to believe they can, the region's growth potential offers benefits which far up the cost of managing these risks and challenges. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Craig. Vikram Nero. Well, thank you very much, Marie, and thank you, Ernie and Marie, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here with Sakamoto-san, Craig, and Suzanne on this panel. Um, I just want to start with the title of this particular panel. It's Infrastructure Connectivity, Where Are the Big Gaps? And it's a curious title, because when you look at the, when you look at the infrastructure needs of Asia, actually, it's not so much roads, ports, and airports uh, that are in demand, though, there are huge demands for that kind of connectivity investments. It's actually energy which comprises the bulk of the needs in, in, in Asia. But even when you look at infrastructure connectivity in Asia and uh, you examine uh, the needs, they're literally everywhere. Um, you know, there are these large uh, inter-country uh, projects on the mainland of Southeast Asia, north, south, east, west corridors. There are the enormous demand for ports in the archipelagic countries of uh, Indonesia and, and, uh, and, and the Philippines. Um, there are enormous needs for uh, infrastructure in a rapidly urbanizing region, uh, and you need you know, good infrastructure for that to ensure that uh, urban centers become uh, drivers, for, drivers for growth. And you need large amounts of uh, connective infrastructure in order to connect urban centers with rural areas to make sure that uh, uh, people can, can, can go to jobs and jobs can go to people and all, the, all of this is going to be part of, uh, part of Asia's sort of future growth. But you add to that, in addition to the urbanization issue, you add to that the environmental issue, the fact that a lot of this infrastructure needs to have a very small carbon, carbon print, carbon footprint. And that means not just that this infrastructure needs are enormous, but they, they need to have a low carbon footprint. And a lot of the infrastructure that's already in place actually needs to be replaced with more energy efficient and better infrastructure. So the infrastructure needs are enormous. So the challenge is not where are the big gaps. The gaps are there. The challenge is how do you fill them? Uh, and, and that's what I'd sort of like to speak to. Now, when you look at how do you fill them, what's very interesting is that people always juxtapose the needs for infrastructure with the financing uh, uh, requirements, and that's you know the eight trillion dollars which keeps uh, popping up. And but no matter what what financing needs uh, uh, estimates you come up with, the reality is that the actual investment in infrastructure that takes place in Asia, especially in non-China Asia, is very small in relation to the needs. So no matter what, the question is how do you up that uh, share of infrastructure investment in Indonesia? As Craig said, it's three percent of GDP. He suggested it could be twice as much. I think it should be four times as much. Uh, it, it is way below uh, uh, where, it, where it should be. Now, the question is this. Where you have in the world economy today low interest rates, huge amounts of liquidity, $90 trillion in asset management funds looking for investments, and you have in Asia infrastructure investments with rates of return of 4 to 8% in real terms on average, with actual rates of return probably in, in several projects much higher than that, the question is, what's happening? Why isn't there this connection between the supply of funds, which is huge, and the demand for funds, which are huge? And I'm going to point to five very important market and policy failures which get in the way. Right? The first and most important market policy failure, as I think a lot of here, uh, as both Sakamoto-san and Craig have hinted to, is the failure of public investment and planning in the bureaucracies of, of, of Asia. Now, the role of the public sector is critical. It's critical because about 50 to 80 percent of all infrastructure investment is undertaken by the public sector. It's by governments. It's government financing, government investment. So unless you have good projects, uh, uh, you, 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 you have a problem of not being able to crowd in private investment. 
Unfortunately, there's a lack of capacity, there's corruption problems, there's land acquisition issues, and there's poor planning. And quite often you find that in infrastructure investments in these countries, the costs are usually 50 or percent or more above the initial costs. So there's always a ramping up of costs, largely because of delays in implementation. So how do you get countries to become more efficient? How do you get bureaucracies to become more efficient in delivering infrastructure? The second challenge is policy uncertainty. Again, something that Craig referred to. Infrastructure projects take three to seven years to build and normally have lives of 10 to 30 years. Right? So you need a stable and attractive rate of return that requires policy stability. But in many of these countries, you have regulatory problems, you have interference in pricing, subsidy, and tax regimes, uh, and these all add to risks for private investors to participate. Then there's the exchange rate risk. You know, in the previous panel, you heard Manu talk about the uncertainties with respect to exchange rate volatility in Asia in, in, in forthcoming years, in coming years, and that's. Uh, an additional risk as far as foreign investors are concerned. The third is the lack of domestic sources of private finance. You know, without having adequate amounts of debt finance from domestic capital markets, you're unlikely to find uh, uh, foreign investors coming in to support, uh, support this uh, financing because you need a certain amount of domestic debt finance to be then counterbalanced with a certain amount of foreign currency denominated uh, debt instruments. Right? Now, Countries in Asia have tried very hard to develop domestic capital markets, but to be very honest with you, this has been a miserable failure in, in Asia. It is one element, uh, uh, so it's, it's been a serious problem as to how you develop uh, domestic capital markets. And the history of development banking has unfortunately also been replete with failure, so they haven't really been very good sources of debt finance. The fourth, and I think this is a very important point, the fourth failure has been the lack of international financial institutions' ability to develop standardized infrastructure asset classes so that there's a well understood risk profile which is analyzed, which can be analyzed and assessed by credit rating agencies so that investor agencies can actually buy these without being too concerned about the underlying risk, recognizing that there is a certain risk profile that matches those financial instruments. Right? So it's clear that from these four binding these are four binding constraints on infrastructure investment, but I want to add one more, a fifth one. And that is that these issues are multiplied several fold when it comes to PPP projects. These are these, are these public private uh, uh, arrangements which uh, Sakamoto san, uh, Sakamoto -san entered, uh, mentioned. Because this is where the private sector, private sector actually enters as an equity partner, not just as a debt financing uh, uh, source. And as soon as you throw in PPP into the mix, this requires far greater government capacity than what is required for normal government investment. The reality is that PPP projects lead to contingent liabilities for government. They have to be managed very carefully. But more important than that, there are these devilishly difficult agreements that have to be negotiated with the private sector partner because the long gestation period is so long and the uncertainties are so great. And it's not, it's not an accident that one of the leaders in PPP projects, which is India, is now having serious problems because many of those uh, uh, agreements have been, in a sense, too tough on the private sector partners. And as a result, those projects have come to a stop. And in fact, there are rising non-performing loans now in, this, in, in the banking system, which have financed many of these projects. And that's, and that's, and that's an issue. Now, let's cue in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So here comes a new bank. And the argument for the new bank is it's going to provide a substantial amount of this large financing gap. But that's not the issue. Finance is not the issue. It, it, it's the implementation capacity that's, that's the challenge, right? And so, the, so the, the AIIB is going to have to figure out that it has to develop the capacity to provide technical assistance, just as the World Bank and the ADB have had to struggle with this. And Sakamoto-san has mentioned the role of, of the Japanese as well that it has to enter this whole messy process of developing capacity because that's where the binding constraint is. And there's nothing, frankly, that I've seen as far as the AIIB is concerned that actually talks about this. You know, talk about the environmental and social safeguards, but they don't talk about the technical assistance capacity that they're going to have to develop, and that's going to take time. Uh, so in the beginning, I suspect the AIB will have to piggyback on the World Bank and the, and, and the ADB, which is fine, but, but in the end, it's going to have to parallel their efforts and, and, and augment their efforts and actually do, going upstream and, and, and improving the, the, the capacity standards of, of these countries.
Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether they will be able to actually add value uh, to, to what the ADB and the World Bank uh, uh, are already doing. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Vikram. Uh, Suzanne Kelly-Lail, you're up. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks very much to CSIS, particularly to Murray and to Ernie for including me in today's important event and with my very distinguished colleagues. I'm so pleased that Vikram's already made the link between infrastructure and environment because I plan to focus more on that, uh, as well as this question of capacity at the AIIB. The pace at which industrial development, oh, excuse me, we have a slide presentation as well, and I just need to make sure that it is up. Uh, and I was told that it was. Maybe somebody, do you know the slides have come up? I'm going to begin, and the slide should be up. The pace at which industrial development is occurring in Asia rivals a Western industrial revolution. The anticipated demographic shifts resulting from continued economic growth in Asia create strong and urgent demand for energy, food, and water. As we've heard today, plans for large-scale infrastructure projects in critical sectors from energy to transportation will provide the foundation for this historical transformation. However, as in all rapid transformative processes, Competing interests pose a challenge to maintaining peace and stability. And in Southeast Asia, uneven levels of economic development, education, and effective governance frameworks add risk for investors, as well as to the communities hoping to share in the promise of ASEAN's full economic integration. The so-called food, energy, and water nexus animates discourse across sectors, engaging government, the private sector, and increasingly civil society. In most countries in Southeast Asia, Lao being the possible exception, the press amplifies these concerns of all stakeholders. And here I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot. Which one is the, I'm sorry, I'm a Mac user. <laughs> Thank you. This is um, a little bit difficult to read, but just a snapshot. This is uh, one of, one page of four of local press from the region. This is all local language publications covering just infrastructure and environment-related issues. It's not like the old days, the press is on it, they are paying attention. Increasingly decision-making around large-scale development projects from Dawai in Myanmar to the Lower Saison II in Cambodia to the region's vast economic land concessions have come under scrutiny, often becoming contested spaces where stakeholders do find little accord. As we know, conflict translates into added costs, both in blood and in treasure. ASEAN is changing at a pace that poses legitimate threats to human security, while clearly offering new opportunities for economic growth, some say unprecedented opportunities. These sometimes contradictory forces are manifest in large-scale projects such as hydro dams, land concessions, and new highway corridors. The scope and scale of challenges advancing the region's ambitious infrastructure plans far exceed the capacity of any one single stakeholder. Uh, no investor can solve all of those challenges. A cooperative approach that enjoins stakeholders will help ensure successful project implementation while mitigating risk. Multi-stakeholder cooperation should be the centerpiece of large-scale infrastructure projects in the region. Government, private sector, and civil society can find common ground in order to raise investor confidence in proposed projects and decrease potential for conflict to create a more enabling environment. To achieve this objective, concrete steps need to be taken to harmonize key environmental safeguards in the region. For example, a regional environmental impact assessment standard will help level the investment field and increase investor accountability, contributing to improve development outcomes for large-scale infrastructure. Regionalizing social and environmental safeguards would mitigate risk to the environment and reduce potential misunderstandings with the communities in which projects are to be cited. This is really a, a key issue right now around almost all the large projects in the region. A harmonized approach, either using a voluntary protocol or an ASEAN certification process would contribute to creating a normative standard to which each stakeholder group's respective interests are more likely to be represented. 
Now, the ADB's new social and environmental safeguard policy is a good place to start and could provide a blueprint for a regional protocol. A lot of investment has gone into revising that, that set of policies. And recently, leading investors such as the World Bank and ADB have placed greater emphasis on robust stakeholder consultation as part of effective project planning. Elevating those practices to the region's overarching architecture within ASEAN could drive positive change and build needed cooperation among government, civil society, and investors. Regularizing and improving on current community engagement so that local voices reach regional platforms, in my view, offers the best opportunity for more equitable development outcomes, and importantly, the mitigation of potential negative social and environmental impacts of infrastructure, in particularly around the transboundary projects. Now, since we're talking about gaps, I'd like to also offer uh, one way that we might fill a gap is to support a high-level development investor partners consortium that could act as a liaison between civil society networks the region, in the region and key institutions such as the ADB, World Bank, and China's new a AIIB. It could also serve as a brain trust and be called upon to advise the region's evolving energy and infrastructure needs and encourage responsible investment practices, for example, through the adoption of the equator principles. The proposed sustainable ASEAN trust could also help improve coordination, reduce redundancy in current donor-led efforts to address these challenges and advocate for greater regional harmonization at the level of national and regu regulatory frameworks. For smaller, localized civil society organizations, regional and international protocols are often critical in leveraging external support. Here's a, oops, back, a very quick snapshot that's impossible to read unless you have extremely good uh, glasses, but this is an organizational network analysis looking at all the civil society organizations in the lower Mekong region working on these issues. Um, and as you can see, uh, there are quite a few, and the density of cluster, which is actually indicated by a red star, and I'm not sure if you can see those, is the level of connectivity um, among organizations. So even tiny organizations at the community level are now reaching up into national and regional networks. Uh, they have influence, they're gaining a voice. And when we take a slightly closer look, we can see that the issues and sectors that civil society organizations have identified as their top priority are very much related to infrastructure development. Hydropower, land rights, livelihoods are all among the top. It may surprise you to learn that among three or 400 CSOs queried as part of a regional assessment, policy barriers were identified as the greatest challenge to enhancing social and environmental safeguards. I argue that a window of opportunity exists for cooperation among stakeholders in the public, the private, and CSOs in reforming uneven legal and regulatory frameworks. And I propose that finding common cause in frustration with cumbersome, often opaque regulatory frameworks provides an important window of opportunity for investors and CSOs to find common cause and begin to build trust. Since it's, excuse me, since the launch of its Go Global Investment Overseas Policy in 2001, China's become, as we've heard today, ASEAN's largest trading partner and is a key regional investor, and particularly uh, in terms of large-scale infrastructure projects and most especially in the Mekong region. China's no longer is just asserting its soft power alone, but increasingly focus on economic power. Capital-intensive infrastructure projects need the $50 billion infusion that the launch of the AIIB promises. Now, leaving aside questions of the changing power dynamic in the region, I posit that the U.S. should engage the AIIB, but with conditions, and that is to build on the excellent work of the ADB and others on including robust social and environmental safeguards as part of their lending and investment practice. Now. I'm running out of time. What can investors do? What can all of you do right now? A couple of things. This is very hard to read. I apologize. Support for a regional environmental impact assessment standard, I believe, is critical and could really improve outcomes. 
encourage the adoption of the equator principles in Asia. There's one Chinese bank in Asia, the uh, China Export Bank, that's uh, adopted the equator principles, no others, but if the AIIB encouraged this as part of its lending pro uh, process, I think we would see a big change. Engage constructively with civil society as development partners and not adversaries. Again, partner with China, but do so conditionally and increase opportunities for robust public consultation. And what does that mean? Uh, it means that communities are not consulted after the EIA process is complete, but at the beginning when their projects are gonna be cited as part of planning. If we do all of this, I think we get a triple bottom line win, and that means that we account for the people, planet, and profits to secure livelihoods and lands, and importantly, to reduce risk and increase investor return on investment faster. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Suzanne. So uh, we're going to now uh, take questions from the floor. If you raise your hand, uh, I will identify you, and then somebody with a microphone will come and please uh, tell us your name and your affiliation and try to ask a question. I saw a hand up there. Uh, Josh? Thank you. I'm Shireen Mohammadi with Moody's Investor Services. Um, my question is for Vikram. I'd be interested in what you think the impact of a sustained low oil price environment would be for net commodity exporters in Asia, such as particularly Indonesia, and their efforts to finance infrastructure and growth. <clears throat> well, as it happens, you know, there's already been some anal analysis of this. Uh, with lower oil prices, uh, Indonesia's revenues, government revenues, from oil have declined. So even though it had a subsidy reduction domestically and it based its budget for this year on the subsidy reduction, it was in a sense caught by surprise by the sudden decline in oil prices and therefore had a big decline in oil revenues. And that's meant that in order to protect its infrastructure program, which still is pretty small by, what, by the amounts that they actually need, but in order to protect their infrastructure program, they're going to have to increase non-oil revenues in the budget, which are basically corporate revenues. And that's essentially what Pagita Viryavan was, was mentioning in his, in, in his keynote address, that they have to expand the tax base. They have to go, you know, as, as he said, not hunt in the, in the zoo, but hunt in the, in the jungle, I think was a phrase he used. I, I thought that was very, very interesting. And the worry is that if they hunt in the zoo, uh, uh, especially foreign investors are extremely worried uh, that they will be called upon to make uh, uh, unacceptable sort of tax payments uh, well beyond what their original sort of agreements agreements were. So it is going to have an impact. Uh, I don't think they're necessarily going to make this big 30% increase in non-oil tax revenues, and that means that the infrastructure program is going to be hurt, and that, that's, uh, that's an interesting outcome of, of low oil prices for a country like Indonesia. Vasuki Shastri from Standard Chartered Bank. I just wanted to get the views of the panel on this inherent tension between policymakers in Asia always look upon China as saying the China model of infrastructure development is something they'd like to emulate, of getting things done fast, of, of re really having the ability of finding the financing, finding the projects, and getting it done in a defined timetable. And the creation of the AIIB, where everyone is now saying this new entity should adhere to World Bank slash ADB type standards. Just wanted to get a sense from the panel, are there any best practices? Are there any projects that you are seeing in, in Asia, outside of China and outside of Korea and Japan, that one can actually build on? Are there airport, are airport building in India, is that a model uh, uh, in, in PPP that others could emulate? And how do you square this tension between China's ability of building super world-class infrastructure uh, but a lot of people criticizing the lack of, uh, the perceived lack of standards. Uh, I can do, take a little bit of that uh, and then let Vikram take over. I mean, I can't speak to uh, engineering and technical expertise, but clearly the social and environmental safeguards and other standards uh, have been set in place. And so it's really up to the AIIB partners to 
exert some pressure uh, on the bank as part of their participation to insist that these standards be used. I mean, it's true, if you talk quietly with uh, various ministries in Southeast Asia, uh, people will say, well, given a choice, we'd like to go where there, there's less restrictive lending and it's very attractive. But the long-term cost of, is enormous. And I think there's a, a, a moment of opportunity right now because uh, Chinese SOEs have been badly burnt in Southeast Asia for investing in projects that really went awry. They felt reputational uh, burns both in the media but also bottom line economic um, losses due to these, these things. Myanmar is quite notable in this regard, but also in Cambodia. So there is a moment, I think, where the AIB will be more open to trying to upgrade some of those standards. So actually, there are, there are, there are two issues. Uh, the, the first is that I get a clear sense from talking to those who are leading the AIIB effort from the Chinese side that they believe that while they want to very much adhere to the standards of the ADB and the World Bank, they don't necessarily believe that the means by which these two institutions adopt those standards is efficient, that it takes much too long. It takes five years for an infrastructure project to be developed because there are all these safeguard sort of reports that have to be prepared. And they believe there is a quicker way to achieve the same standards. Now, I don't know whether that's going to be right or wrong, but that is their assessment. Uh, and and uh, it'll be inter interesting to see. And that's why I think the introduction of the AIIB is a good thing because it actually adds competition to processes. And you know, if we believe competition is good in the private sector, well, why shouldn't it be good in the public sector, especially in the multi-development banking field? So I think that it, it's a good thing and let's see if they come up with new ideas. The second point is that I think the AIIB is on a different score, going to be in for a bit of a rude shock because Chinese investors in China are used to having extremely capable implementation agencies. But they're going to have to deal now with a much messier situation in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, but also South Asia. And uh, um, this is what is going to, I think, be the, the bigger challenge as far as uh, the AIIB is concerned. And by the way, if you just if you take the airport uh, case, uh, the, 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 the PPPs of Indian airports, there's a recent uh, report by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, which points out enormous problems actually in these airports because it's just the reality of PPP projects and in infrastructure that they are complicated. You cannot take into account all the contingencies unless you have a very good mechanism to deal with disputes as they arise. If those disputes fester, the project becomes a failure. I'd just like to footnote what's already been said by, by referring to um, this. It's, it's something that KPMG International did in 2009. It's a list of the 10 major impediments for private infrastructure. And I'll read off just a few of them. Uh, but again, politicization, I just cannot pronounce that word of infrastructure project priorities, frequent changes in public policy, lack of appropriate public policy, lack of a sense of urgency, corruption, misuse of funds, and on and on. And, and what's striking about this list is that nowhere is finance mentioned. So there's, you know, AIB was no doubt a diplomatic coup, I guess, uh, but I'm not sure really in the overall scheme of things, especially since ADB's capital base is larger and we're putting in you know, about 2% of what's required, how much of a financial coup it's gonna turn out to be, at least in the short term. I guess what we expect is that AIB will co-finance with ADB and the World Bank in the first few years to get some things started and when they have their own capacity to design and process and implement these projects, they'll strike out on their own. Surely China has a lot more resources where this came from, but AIB has morphed, I think, uh, the past few weeks into something very different than what was planned. At first, it looked like it was gonna be Asian countries, perhaps a few from the Middle East, lending to other Asian countries. And now that the Europeans, Scandinavians, Eastern Europeans, South Americans, who knows, well, Australia, New Zealand, 
it's, it's become something very different than what I think its founders thought it would become. And that's going to mean that they take on a different business model, I think, than what was planned. And how this translates, you know, into projects, whether they look a lot like those that ADB and World Bank support, or whether they look more like the Chinese way of doing things. Uh, thanks to single party state, I think they were able to get things through the system a little bit faster than some of these other countries where politicization is an issue. Um, but yeah, that's my comment on things. Thanks. Um, rather than directly answering to the, the question from the floor, I would like to echo what uh, Dr. Nell said. Um, the emergence of AIB created a competition among international uh, banks in terms of process. Uh, the recently, ADB decided to combine two different, but two different funds in order to increase significantly their lending capacity. That, you know, the Craig knows the details of this. And also I heard that the ADB decided to improve their procurement procedures. I think this is good things. And I think this is good side effect of AIB. Thank you. Ernie? Uh, Ernie Bauer with CSIS. I, you know, it strikes me that, um, you know, when you're talking about the, the gap uh, here, that the United States looks, you know, from a, this is sort of a policy question. The United States looks sort of flat-footed and, and unable to respond to how dynamic a, the Asia that you're describing is. Um, what recommendations would you have for U.S. policymakers to sort of catch up with the uh, dynamism that you're describing here? I mean, I, I think we're in a really awkward situation uh, where the United States has said geopolitically Asia is the most important part of the world. Uh, they have, you know, quote unquote, pivoted to the region that I think Asia felt like that was a little military. Do you see a comprehensive economic policy that includes development and, and finance and trade uh, anywhere in the different drawers in the U.S. government? How do we, how would they pull this together and respond to what you've described? I mean, you've quantified and qualified the need. Uh, I'd like to hear the panel's take on that. Well, there's a very easy one for you. Who's going to start? I like a challenge. <laughs> I think the rebalance, I mean, the point that you just made, the rebalance really has been understood in terms of military rebalance, and uh, there's been a real paucity of uh, investment to stand behind that. So the U.S. has, I think, still a very important and dynamic role to play in the region. One of, one of the things we could do is to really look more at ASEAN uh, from the policy perspective. Uh, ASEAN has a, a unique history. It's, it is the key architecture in the region. I don't think the U.S. has played the role it could. I think that if we were to put uh, more resources behind ASEAN to help with some of this regulatory harmonization, in particular, again, to ride on the AAC and the TPP, this is a great moment. And I think under Malaysia's leadership, there may be greater openness to the U.S. having a different relationship with ASEAN than in the past. So that would be my first suggestion. Anybody else? I thought your question was, was, was terrific, Ernie. And, uh, you know, the reality is that the United States currently, in my view, is playing with a relatively weak deck, right? Uh, it's, uh, apart from its fiscal situation and, and the fact that China has sort of huge resources, Growth of trade between Southeast Asia and China is growing at 20 percent a year and has been for the last 30 years. So increasingly, the countries of, Southeast, uh, of South Asia and Southeast Asia are being drawn into the gravitational orbit of China. And that gives enormous impetus to uh, uh, expanding this trading arrangement into financial areas. And we, what we didn't talk about trade in services and so forth. So there's, an, there's, there's a progression that's taking place in Asia, which is going to enter into financial flows which is going to follow trade flows. And the United States doesn't have that advantage. So that's the first point. So how does the US then, how can the US deal with this deck of cards? Well, it must leverage itself. And the way it should leverage itself, in my view, is first of all, be far more proactive as far as IMF governance is concerned. So there, are, there isn't this pressure that uh, um, uh, 
that emerges in, in the creation of other, market, uh, other institutions. But you may, you may or may not know this, there was a global infrastructure financing facility that was created in the World Bank that was in fact torpedoed by the United States and other sort of advanced countries because it would have been largely financed by China. And they, didn't, they saw that as a backdoor entry of China getting greater say in the World Bank. That kind of unfortunate defensive thinking has led to the creation of the AIB and complicated matters a great deal. So I think a much more supportive, participatory uh, approach, it would have been great if they had agreed to join the AIB right from the get-go and you know, have much greater influence from the inside than be seen as a petulant observer from the outside. Uh, um, so I think that attitude, I think, has to change and uh, uh, there should be a willingness to engage a lot more. Just purely personal views. <laughs> I just would like the U.S. president to come to Asia every year. There's a good opportunities uh, for him or her to come to Asia. APEC summit and ASEAN summit in, in usually October. Um, any good policies, different policies, can be developed only through the dialogue, the real dialogue. And the presence of president, of our leaders, of the nations, really, really encouraging for us officials to facilitate the consideration, the preparations, trying to come up with a real outcome through APEC and the dialogue with ASEAN. Thank you. Mike. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. I know we're talking about Asia, but isn't the real issue in terms of the United States that our whole attitude and financing of infrastructure at the moment is really lagging? How can, how can the U.S. be a pusher or an innovator on infrastructure development when the common wisdom is that the gateway to the third world is Kennedy Airport and compare, compare our subway system with any subway system in uh, in a major Asian metropolis. We're just way behind on this thing, and I don't know if any of you feel like giving advice to the United States, but <laughs> we seem to be having a problem in this area. Is anybody want to engage? <laughs> yeah, I'm, don't take me seriously, but it was suggested by someone the other day that the U.S. should sign up for AIB to become a borrower to improve its infrastructure with Chinese assistance. So. No, but I think that's no. a joke. <laughs> but I think there's there is an important point that that is being made here. Um, the problem, as I pointed out, are that these five big binding constraints to the movement of private capital, of which there's a huge amount, moving for infrastructure development, and that's a challenge not within the United States. That's a challenge. Uh, because there are problems within the developing countries which need that infrastructure. So that's not a U.S. problem. That's a developing country problem. The only way that capital then can actually move, if it's not going to be the private sector, is the public sector. And that's where the United States, unfortunately, has relatively weak instruments because its aid budget is limited. You know, Congress has a clear sort of concern about the amount of, of actual aid that is going to be uh, transferred or the amount of participation or increase in the capital of both the IMF and, uh, and the World Bank as well as by you know, the, the, the ADB. And so there is a limitation on the amount of fiscal resources that are being applied, but that currently is the main channel through which advanced countries can support infrastructure development in developing countries. And that's incidentally exactly what the AI be doing. These are fiscal instruments. These are not private sector financial instruments. On a slightly more upbeat note, actually USAID does offer uh, high-level technical assistance specifically geared toward infrastructure development in Southeast Asia. It's been working very closely with the government of Laos. Um, it's trying to work with Myanmar. I think increasing that those levels uh, of funding would be a tremendous step in the right direction. Um, it's also, interestingly, probably one of the few areas in our own country that both parties could agree on. Uh, for sure, private sector actors working in um, infrastructure development in the U.S. would love the opportunity to, to engage more directly in Asia. So I'd love to see more funding go into USAID projects targeting that way and for the State Department maybe to take a greater role.
can't apologize for the infrastructure here. Having lived in Asia this past year, every time I came back to the U.S., I thought it was a strange reversal of how things <laughs> used to be. <laughs> uh, the, the, sorry, the woman in the red uh, blouse, please. Hi, um, my name is Anna Yukonanov. I'm with Reuters. I was wondering, it, this isn't strictly the topic of the panel, but one thing I find interesting about the AIB is that it's also operating in the broader Asia, not just Asia Pacific, but also Middle East and Central Asia. And I was wondering how that you think that would shape what kind of projects it does, and d should it influence the other banks? For example, outside of just partnering with the World Bank and ADB, some think it should partner with some of the Middle Eastern countries and in their investments, since they've already invested, you know, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Anybody have views? I worked on uh, regional economic cooperation schemes for a number of years. I was based in Almaty and Bangkok and worked with a bunch of different countries on prioritizing investments in transport, energy, um, and what have you. And um, the Chinese were part of all of these schemes um, because they're a member in good standing with ADB and a lot of Asia uh, shares a border with China. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see AIB uh, Pro, uh, providing support for for infrastructure development with neighboring countries that 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 needs to be done, but because you know sometimes getting things done through a multilateral institution is easier than doing so bilaterally because uh, things tend to get politicized um, when it's done bilaterally. I wouldn't be surprised to see AIB take on some projects where that, that, that are good for everyone in the end, but which um, China has been unable to do on its own. Um, I'm referring to roads, uh, to transmission lines, to pipelines, railways, roadways, uh, ports, airports, anything and everything that will improve its connectivity with, with countries uh, that share its border. Um, what's the end game in this? I'm not quite sure. If, uh, we've all heard of the Eurasian supercontinent where you've got high-speed railways from Shanghai to Edinburgh and uh, pipelines that crisscross the region and so on. I, I guess all of this is possible now, you know, not just because of AIB, but because Iran has signed up for AIB. Um, because Myanmar has opened up, um, because uh, finance isn't the problem really, it's just coming up with bankable projects and, and maybe this new instrument to get things done will, will allow us all to see some things happen that we've been un unable to do on our own. Please. Arshad Zayed, I'm from Peabody Energy, and I've worked in uh, the same institution that Vikram has maybe for half the years, but um, I have a very simple perspective now coming out, um, and you know, as you look at what is needed here, uh, and you look at the cost of capital in Asia, uh, in many of these countries is much higher than what you would find here. And as we know, firms go for a simple equation, return versus risk. And how do you bring down that risk? Vikram pointed to many of the factors that are political, social, you mentioned as well, uh, and the economic side, right? One of the ways you bring down the cost of capital is through creative means of financing this. And the way um, you are able to do this is very important, particularly in project financing, where you bring in debt, equity instruments, and other things and whereas the discussion has so far been on governments and what the failures have been uh, to characterize uh, Vikram's uh, five points, uh, more on the government and, and market failures, uh, less so, in fact, on the fact that the, in, the international institutions, particularly the World Bank, ADB, IFC, themselves have not actually addressed this, particularly the technical 
capacity side, not just on the government, which is also important, but internally as well. And the reason I say this is because as you think of AIIB, I think the assumption is that the bank and the IFC have the knowledge, have the technical capability, have the ability, and going by the past 30 years, one would be, you know, we would have to struggle to look at real successes in project financing that the bank, ADB, IFC have done. And so why would you suddenly now believe that AIIB, you could teach something to AIIB uh, besides the procurement standards and things like that? So it's a question I, I ask about internal um, uh, capacity within uh, the international institutions as you think about AIIB. Vikram? You know, my response to that, Arshad, is that it's not for lack of trying that the World Bank and the ADB and others have found it so difficult to draw in private finance into infrastructure projects. It's just because the nature of the problem is so complex. Uh, um, now, for example, if you have, uh, the, big, the two big risks are political risk and policy risk, right? Those are the two big risks. If you have through, you know, uh, cover your political risk through MIGA, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, and you cover your policy risk through government guarantees, you can get over a significant amount of those hurdles. But then when you have government guarantees that introduces a continued liability, the continued liability then has to be factored into fiscal policy, and many of these countries already have significant debt burdens, so this is a constraint as far as public policy is concerned. It's only when you have enormous public uh, po uh, fiscal space that you're able to take on such significant uh, continued liabilities. So there is an engineering dimension, the financial engineering dimension that can be brought to bear on these, but I don't think they necessarily get to the nub of the question, which is eventually sort of the policy constraints that developing countries face. Jump in. There's a question back there. <clears throat> Yes, hi, thanks. I'm David McCauley from WWF, uh, WWF and previously a colleague of Craig's at Asian Development Bank, where I was climate director. So I'm pleased to see the sustainability issues coming out in this panel, and Wickram uh, kicked that off by noting the need for low-carbon development uh, as a part of this uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, I would add to that also the, the need to cope with the anticipated impacts of climate change and the resiliency associated with the infrastructure. And it's not just limited to the Asian push. Uh, we've heard about the need for infrastructure around the world, and of course G20 is pushing this, uh, this uh, within its discussions as well. So I, I would just put to the panel, as a part of this call for technical assistance and and a framing of the investment climate, um, no pun intended, how, how, can we, uh, how can we encourage policies and, uh, and structures to this investment that are going to encourage uh, attention to, say, uh, renewable energy over fossil fuels or rail versus highways for intracity investment or electricity, uh, smart electricity grids and electric vehicles versus those kinds of investments which are really necessary as we move forward in a carbon constrained world. Thanks. Could I, could I just suggest, because we're uh, about five minutes from finishing this panel, there's another gentleman on the same table who's had his hand up. Maybe we take two questions and then, uh, then we'll have our panel answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Paul Cadero from the University of Toronto, and, and as with many other things, there's very little light between me and Vikram, um, who's a former colleague at the World Bank as well. Um, I'm wondering whether a lot of this debate is uh, uh, premature in the sense that there are a great many paradoxes and sort of, well, why did AIB get set up? What's wrong with the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank, et cetera? And if we step back a bit, and thought about, well, what are all the paradoxes involved here? We might actually come at this with a somewhat less alarmist frame. Um, the equator principles, everybody says, great idea, the private sector will come in, they'll invest, there'll be standards. But remember, the equator principles are principles. You know, and you, you adopt the equator principles because you don't want your annual meeting uh, picketed. Uh, 
yes, there need to be the sort of rules that the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank have for procurement and safeguards. Yes, and that's why the AIB got set up, because the clients of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, to a lesser extent, don't like waiting five years for a complicated infrastructure project and dislike the contestability of the inspection panel and then being ripped to pieces again as members of the bank, of the banks, that are then protested against. So it strikes me that we ought to, in this debate, be giving more thought to why is there discontent and is there a 21st century way of delivering this and not looking at China because there have been some spectacular engineering failures in China's infrastructure, that if we stood back for a moment and thought, what is the problem we're trying to solve, we might do a better job. And I'm suggesting, I don't have the answer to that question, but I'm suggesting we ought to stand back and rather than blaming the Obama administration or looking at China's need to keep its rapacious construction industry employed or saying, you know, the, every, there's, there's a lack of capital and nowhere to put it somewhere, that we ought to actually step back and say, well, what is it that these countries need and where are they likely to go and what can we do to make that simpler and faster? And I don't think we've come up with that answer yet, even though there's been a great deal of time spent in this room and in think tanks all over the world looking at that. Just to sort of, you know, inviting maybe a member of the panel to respond to, well, what would a simpler answer look like? Thanks. So, uh, two questions on the table. Um, who wants to kick us off? I'd like to, to start Suzanne. with the second question. Um, I think what you've said is critically important, actually. And I think the first answer to that is the broader engagement in the discourse. I mean, it is not simply uh, the purview of investors of the multilaterals um, in a closed door room to make decisions about large scale infrastructure that will affect the lives of millions and millions. So part of this really is engaging with other organizations in civil society. Uh, these stakeholder consultation processes are, are not just supposed to be a check the box. It's, it's a very important way in which local people can have a voice in this. And I would say that also gets to the point of sustainability and what types of projects, and will they be climate resilient, for example? Um, if you ask people in the local community whether they want smart infrastructure, once they understand what that is, is a microgrid useful for you? Uh, most likely they say yes when they understand how it works versus sometimes a large scale hydro dam, for example. So I don't think it's so complicated and insurmountable. I think the real challenge is, again, with these larger institutions um, trying to break down these processes that have evolved over time and go about this in a different way, which is to bring in more local voices. Anybody else on? Great, Toshi-san, no, no. Um, I would like to answer, respond to the first question, the climate and uh, energy matters. I think in order to facilitate low carbon, in, in, in order to facilitate the introduction of low carbon infrastructure, in particular energy area, uh, policy incentive is really essential. Um, for example, Japan created new crediting mechanism for low carbon infrastructure, in particular energy infrastructure, power generation facilities. As you may know, uh, UN, United Nations, introduced CDM, Clean Coal Development Mechanism. Uh, but it was uh, too bureaucratic, uh, too difficult to use. Uh, therefore, um, we Japanese government uh, decided to introduce bilateral crediting mechanism rather than multilateral under UN, which is called JCM, Joint Crediting Mechanism. This creates incentive for developing countries to introduce uh, low carbon infrastructure. And it has been quite successful. And another example is uh, public financial support for a highly efficient coal fire uh, power plant. Uh, this is a contentious issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, US administration at this moment. But in order to um, in order to address uh, climate change issues, uh, we believe that it's essential to continue such financial support for highly efficient clean coal power plant. Thank you. 
Bikramar. Yeah, let me on, uh, try and answer the first question, which I thought was a great question. And I'm going to give you, unfortunately, a very narrow economist's answer, so I apologize in advance. Um, how, do you, how do you ensure that you get low-carbon infrastructure? Well, there are really three simple, well, not three simple ones, but, but three ways. The first is through regulation. The second way is through having some kind of a carbon price. Uh, uh, or the third is to apply the shadow price of carbon to projects. So there are three ways that you can do this, right? The United States has chosen a regulatory approach. Uh, Europe and China, at least in a pilot project, have tried to develop a price of carbon through a sort of carbon exchange mechanism. So that's the second means by which you can try and establish a price of carbon. And the third is by introducing a carbon tax. You can actually introduce a carbon tax, but that means that you're going to have to figure out what the carbon tax is. There is no market mechanism by which you can arrive at a, at, at a, carbon, at a carbon price. So there are the, all these means that you can do so. And lastly, of course, apply a shadow price for carbon, but that's, to my mind, perhaps the least effective because it doesn't introduce incentives into the system to ensure low carbon footprint. All this is very easy to say from an economist's point of view. The challenge is always the political economy of these, of these approaches. And uh, they've received absolutely no traction uh, in not just in developing countries, uh, but also in advanced countries, as you well know. Um, I'm not quite sure how to say this, except um, in the past 48 hours, I've seen two articles. One referred to uh, Chinese support. The implication was ADB, but we'll see, uh, AIB, but we'll see. Chinese support for a pipeline from Iran to Pakistan. It's been talked about for years. It's never gotten anywhere sanctions and everything else came into play. It, meantime, Pakistan is, has, has huge energy, uh, has a huge energy deficit that it's dealing with. And, and for all the problems in Pakistan today, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that people are going to make much headway unless the energy situation there is uh, addressed in a more, well, unless they have more juice. <laughs> and if Iran can provide it and the Chinese will build it, you know, how this sort of issue gets played off against the concerns that you're raising, David, will be a real interesting discussion. And I would say that if AIB takes on this project, this is a real uh, test for them, whether they do it right or wrong, whether the U.S. will join AIB someday or say, we told you some and we're staying, you know, we're staying away. Uh, the other article, and, and it, it had to have been wrong, um, referred to a new railway that the Chinese will construct between Tibet and Nepal, and I presume to the Gulf one day, uh, through Mount Everest. <laughs> There's going to be this giant tunnel through Mount Everest. And I read that and thought, no, it can't be true. And anyway, you know, on the one hand, there are these good things that could come out of this new dynamic that that has uh, that is taking place, and uh, could really transform some of the problems that we've all been contending with for a long time. Uh, move some things forward. On the other, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of static out there too. That that's very confusing and sort of lends ammunition to the critics uh, that uh, that uh, maybe things aren't as good as they seem. And all I can say is that we just have to wait and see. Meantime, you know, the argument is really whether you see a glass half full or half empty. Great. Thank you. Uh, before uh, I ask you to join me in thanking the speaker, I'm just going to mention that we're going to have a uh, pause for lunch. There's going to be uh, food in the, in the back. Uh, please go and uh, get your food. And we'll resume here at uh, tw uh, 1245, so half an hour. So please join me in thanking Toshi-san, uh, Craig, um, Vikram, and Suzanne. Thank you.